We good? Okay. Um, I got a text today from somebody that I, I thought was, I was pretty inspired by it. Um, the text from the person that shall remain nameless. You okay with me sharing this? class last night was so good. This is the class, the Gita class we had last night. I never get any compliments on my classes, so whenever I do, once in a blue moon, I just make sure to dedicate the whole weekend to shamelessly publicizing the compliments I get. The texts we read were really sweet and comforting and parental slash fatherly. It felt personal, even personal to myself. It was the first time I had really felt like I saw Krishna's personality. It's the first time I really felt like I saw Krishna's personality. It was the first time I really felt that I could imagine Krishna as a being. I know we have deities and pictures, and I've heard other stories and classes, but it's been hard for me. We went over last night, had me think for the first time that Krishna loves me. And not just me, but all the devotees. And it made me think his heart is so big. And I felt giddy ever since thinking that Krishna loves me. And it made me feel close to him. There's more, but that was the, that was the thing I that I wanted to read. I was super happy to get this text. Um, you know, uh, someone who shall remain nameless, Dalen. I, mean, I wish he was here so I could humiliate him to his face, but hopefully he's watching online. He said, uh, He raised his hand and said, you know, I just want to say that out of all the class I've heard, I felt this was the best one. And I thought to myself, man, you've been here for like five minutes and you're going to pontificate on behalf of the whole room. Like, I got the six classes you've heard in your life. That's the best one. There's a bunch of ways who's been here ten times as long as you have. And that's how I gave him some heat. About it. I just ignored his compliment and then gave him heat afterwards. Um, to stay in his lane um, and be a newbie and not try to speak on behalf of the whole community. And then he likes to do that. She looks like she's run away too. Um, one time and then he wrote, we do these joint birthday cards where everybody signs it and says something nice. Oh, there you are, Dan. I was just talking about you. And it wasn't nice. <laughs> you missed it, though, brother. It's all love, though. Um, but so and then he's got this thing where anyway, one time I don't remember who it was. We did these joint birthday cards. Everybody writes down the birthday card, and then he wrote, "On behalf of the whole community, I would like to wish you a happy birthday." And when we read that, like. It was so pretentious that Anandini was going to speak on behalf of the whole community. And we've been razzing her about that for like the last five years. <laughs> Is it not? Yeah. <laughs> everybody, like, as soon as they talk about everybody, they, they come walking in. We still razz you about that, right? Yeah. And when I was giving Dale and Heat, I just immediately, like, segued right. You, were, you knew it was coming, didn't you? 
<laughs> so I go, oh, and then the, on behalf of the community, of the Maharani of the whole community, I'm going to let you know. Um, anyway, I, I shrugged off Dalen's compliment. This one I found a little harder to shrug off. It was an appreciation of Krishna's words, not mine. And it meant I did a good job of representing them. Didn't put my own spin on it cheesily with poor logic, like people do. But it meant that the words that I, the feeling I got from reading the verses, I was able to convey it to somebody else. And that was really rewarding for me as a teacher to be able to get out of the way of Krishna's words and represent them as they are, instead of just making something up, making up a funny conclusion. Um, I was able to actually convey what was there in the text, what's always inspired me about it. Um, also, I appreciated it, and this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. I appreciate it because really when you think about it, what is a theology? A theology really, as far as I can tell, in the simplest terms possible, a theology is a picture of what God is like. Who God is what God is like, what are the defining features of the deity. Now, there are arguments for the existence of God, and that's almost like a pre-theology. I mean, it's part of theology, but it's the entry point. Arguments for the existence of God, rebuttals, systematic rebuttals, apologetics, polemics against arguments against God's existence. Those are parts of the theology. But once you cross that bridge and we're no longer trying to convince you to believe in a higher power, the rest of the time is telling you about that higher power. Who or what that higher power is. One of our framers, Jiva Goswami, who five centuries ago systematized our theology, he wrote that your gurus, your shravan gurus, the gurus you hear from, they teach you about two things. They teach you about the deity, and they teach you about so the object that you're pursuing, and they teach you about the method that you use to pursue. The object and the means of achieving that object the sadhya and the sadhana, the goal and the practice. But really, I think if you want to get really essential, what actually happens is you paint a picture about the nature of the deity, you tell somebody what God's like, and then from that idea about what God's like, automatically, logically, you could even say necessarily as a byproduct of really fully understanding what God's like, who God is, then what comes automatically? Huh? Loving God? I don't know what that means, but okay. What comes automatically? You guys are going to feel kind of foolish. I mean, like... I just said, you describe elegantly the personality of God and therefore, and what comes automatically? The personality. No, it didn't because you just spent a bunch of time describing it. So that would be the opposite of it coming automatically. What comes automatically? Yeah, that came beforehand because that's the belief in God that was a precursor to what I'm trying to explain. But you get credit. You get less credit. But you get, I mean, you get credit for opening your mouth. So there's that. So... Everybody else didn't get credit for that. So you get credit for that. You're, you're working with me, but you missed it because I already, I already set that one aside 
and you just said what I said you had to work for, what comes automatically? Huh? Did you know that the whole time? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Then you got to speak up, chief. The means to achieve the object, the practice. Remember I said there's two things, there's a practice, and then there's the object, there's the object and the way of achieving that object. Remember I did that whole thing, and I said, then when you talk about the object enough, what happens automatically? I said, he said there's two things, but actually if you want to get elegant, there's only one thing. The one thing is you describe the nature of the deity, and automatically by describing the nature of the deity, what comes automatically? Do you guys feel foolish yet? Nick, you feel foolish? Yeah. You awake? Mostly. I'm hearing I, I, didn't, I didn't do the, the 2 plus 2, though. Okay. Do you feel foolish as a result of not being able to do 2 plus 2? Yeah. This is kind of a big point in my class. You, I, I was expecting you guys to all automatically get it because it seems extremely obvious to me. Our theologian said there's two things that you're taught. But really, if you want to essentialize it down to one thing, this is the one thing. And then automatically the byproduct is the other thing. Get it? You guys with me? Here's why. If you understand, and you know, this is the picture. Is God personal or impersonal? Is he loving or angry? Is he remote or nearby? What's the nature of that love that's possible with the deity? Is that love formal or intimate? You're, what you're really doing when you answer all these questions, what is God like? What does God dislike? What is good? What leads to divinity? What's the nature of the deity? These questions are all about painting a picture of who the person Krishna is. Do you guys follow this? They can just lessen the bell. They don't have to, like, they're not trying to win a party. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. If you understand that God's angry and is going to punish you. And then you understand you should be filled with fear. If you understand that God's loving and personal and intimate, you can start to actually do some math with that. You're nodding your head too early. Shouldn't make sense yet. I'm just going to start over because I feel like like I started the train and you guys hadn't gotten on yet. And so I'm just going to reverse back and go back to the train station. I'd like it if you guys could pay attention. Let's just do that. Let's just really try to focus now. Because I have something I want to say, and I've never said it before, and I feel like we need, we need to go here together. So I'm looking around. It doesn't seem like you guys quite got it. Here we go. Are we, are we taking it seriously yet? Okay. All right. This isn't like a commercial. This is the show that you guys came to watch. It's like the show. It's the beginning when they tell you everybody's name and they lay it all out, what the show's going to be about. And if you miss it, you kind of don't know what's going on. That's this episode. All right. I got a nice text yesterday. Class last night was so good. The texts we read were really sweet and comforting and parental slash fatherly. It felt personal, even personal to myself. It was the first time I'd really felt like I saw Krishna's personality. It was the first time I really felt like I could imagine Krishna as a being. I know we have the deities and pictures and I've heard other stories and classes, but it's been hard for me. What we went over last night had me think for the first time that Krishna loves me. And not just me, but all the devotees. And it made me think his heart's so big and I felt giddy ever since thinking that, that Krishna loves me and it's made me feel close to him. I appreciated that feedback tremendously. 
because it meant I did a good job of getting out of the way of Krishna so that his verses were represented cleanly. And what I saw and what inspired me so much was able to be seen by somebody else. But additionally, what I appreciated was that it honed in on something that I feel really strongly about that I don't think I've ever fully articulated. And that is that a theology ultimately is about describing the nature of the higher power, divinity, God, whatever you want to call God. Now, there are precursors to this, and that would be arguments for the existence of God or arguments against, you know, rebuttals of God's existence, arguments against God's existence, and you, you rebut them, and that's, that's also a part of theology. But where theology really begins, in my mind, is once you get past that and you believe in God, therefore you have faith. And you then, the theologian has to paint a picture for you of what the nature of God is. Is, is God angry and violent? Or is he loving and warm? Is God paternal or maternal? Or animalistic? Is God remote or close by? Is God human or non-human? Is God personal or impersonal? Is God noble or unknowable? These questions, the answers to these questions, in the form of painting a picture about what God is, as far as I can see, are the entirety of a theology. And the reason for that is because from these answers comes the practice, comes the ritual, comes everything else. So even though our primary framer said that there are two things you learn, you learn about the nature of the object that's meant to be achieved, the deity, and you learn about the method of achieving that deity, the sadhya, the goal, and the sadhana, the practice. Although that's true, the argument I'm making now is that ultimately the practice for achieving the deity is actually an automatic byproduct of your conception of the deity. The practice to achieve the deity is an automatic byproduct of a full and complete conception of the deity. For instance, if Krishna is a loving, personal deity that's the cause of all causes, that's intimately lovable, then it makes perfect sense that, that all you have to do is cry out to Krishna in order to achieve him. It would make sense that the ritual would be a very personal ritual where you welcome Krishna into your family and cook for Krishna and care for Krishna. If you're meant to call, if, if the deity is intimately lovable, then how do you intimately love somebody? You serve them in a very sweet and intimate way. It would make sense that you wouldn't be afraid of the deity and that your ritual wouldn't be based on like ritualism per se, but it would be meant to augment and heighten feelings of intimacy and love. And that when you lost that, you would straight off the path. Are you guys following us? And so, I think the entirety of a theology, our entire like proselytizing, what it means to become converted, is you become convinced about a particular conception of divinity. And that's what outreach is. It's really sharing our conception of divinity. Now obviously, before you discuss a conception of divinity, you have to make people believe that there is a divinity, and therefore that's part, but that's the beginning. That's the beginning. That's step one. Arguments for why God, it's reasonable to believe in God. Arguments against the rebuttals of God's existence, etc. That's kind of the beginning. And once you, can, once you can, can finish that debate, and the person's ready to move forward, then the rest of the journey is trying to paint somebody a picture of who Krishna is.
And if you understand how loving Krishna is, how easy Krishna wants to make it, how much of a sliding scale Krishna is giving, how forgiving Krishna is, what's possible, then the idea that like, this is the purpose of life, and there's nothing else that compares, and I should dedicate my whole life to this. And you can almost feel your way through to all of our practices. The chanting of the Lord's name, the opening of your heart, the turning towards divinity. Because of the loving relationship, it has to be synergistic. We have to have free will. We have to be part of the package. All this stuff starts to make perfect sense. Some of this stuff is not rigorously provable. To some extent, I think arguments for the probability and the strongness of the position uh, uh, for, God, for God's existence are easier to make than when you discuss the nature of divinity. I do think you can make really powerful arguments for the nature of divinity. I spend most of my time trying to do it. But to some extent, I think it's easier almost to, to do the intro. You should believe in God. When you start to really paint a picture of what God's like, it gets really individual and personal. And I wouldn't say arbitrary, because I do think there's powerful arguments to be made for why God should be all good. Um, there's an argument from omnipotence that the nature of omnipotence is that there's nothing standing in your way. And what stops people from being good is that there are desires which are selfish and they represent human frailties. If you had an omnipotent being, those human frailties would not be there, and therefore there would be no selfishness, and therefore there would be no blockage from acting good. That's an argument from omnipotence to omnibenevolence that's, uh, that's, that's propounded by, um, who is it? Uh, forgive me, I'll remember his name in a second. English, English philosopher Oxford, you don't know? Huh? Oh yeah, Richard Swinburne. Thank you. <laughs> Cha-ching. Yeah, that Swinburne makes that argument really nicely. Another argument can be made from looking at human beings who have the capacity for understanding God, and therefore we would be the closest to God because we're endowed by the ability to relate to the deity. And therefore, if you look at what makes human society flourish, it's things like compassion, cooperation, and selflessness. And so then you can make an argument that that would be God's nature from looking at what brings human beings together. I think there's great arguments along these lines. Um, but I think there's more room for artistry when it comes to talking about the personality of divinity. I think it's much more mathematical when you're arguing for God's existence. And once you cross that bridge, it becomes much more artistic. And if you look at things like, you know, like let's say the law of karma from one lifetime to another. There's no real rigorous proof for that. Some people go down that road, they try and argue for past life regression and stuff like that. I, I find such arguments to be underwhelming, to say the least. You know, I went to an astrologer and he read my palm, even though he's an astrologer. And he threw a tarot, he told me my last life. I was a queen of England, because everyone somehow is a queen or a king. No one's a serf or a peasant who lived a life of total, like, you know, uh, like, a, like a total, a life of total mediocrity, <laughs> like where they did nothing of value. Somehow I was this really important person, because I came to them and gave them 10 bucks. And, and then, you know, they, they, they told me about my past life, and that's my evidence for why I believe in past lives. Or, you know, there was somebody who could speak Swedish at the age of three, even though they were raised in a village in India. And it's just, it's so tough to try and ratify that stuff because there's always so many ways to doubt, reasonably doubt such things. Really, if you want to look at the argument for karma from life to life, it's an argument from abduction. It's an argument from, you know, to the most reasonable conclusion possible. And so if you've already gotten around the idea of whether or not you believe in God, then what you have to do is you have to paint a picture that makes sense of the world. And so a world in which their karma 
makes a lot of sense. I'll explain why in a minute. If the person then says, well, I don't believe in God because of we don't remember you know, our karma from lifetime to lifetime. At that point, what you have to do is you have to say, if I can give you a reasonable explanation for why karma would be consistent with all good and all powerful deity, then you can no longer use that as a reason for not believing in God. Then they go, well, I got other reasons why I don't believe in God. Then you go, okay, then don't give me that dumb argument for karma. We have to go back and do the God exists argument. So that at a certain point, I want to be done with that argument. And now I want to get into painting you a picture of what God's like. And if you want to say to me, well, the nature of God that you're describing is incompatible with the suffering I see in the world, then I, but the only thing I have to do at that point is show you a version of reality where God's all good and it accounts for all the stuff you see in this world. You follow? I don't have to offer you any evidence. Because your argument isn't that there's not evidence of it. Because there are many things in life which there might not be evidence of. There's lots of things where it's not reasonable to expect to be evidence. Evidence of love is different than evidence of the temperature. Evidence of a heart murmur is different than evidence of compassion. There are different things that exist in the world. And so we should look for different types of evidences to prove or show as reasonable the existence of various types of things. But there's not one standard of evidence for everything. Did you guys follow this? There are things that really exist, like emotions, and feelings, and thoughts, and ideas, and beauty. And the evidence for those things which are as intrinsic to our existence as anything else. How about consciousness? The least doubtable thing in creation. Consciousness can, cannot be proven. There's no way to prove that other people are conscious. It's called the problem of other minds. Because people could be philosophical zombies who just react to stimuli in the same way you do. How do you know that there is a ghost in the machine? Well, you're conscious. And therefore you extrapolate from that. And analogously you grant the idea of consciousness to others because you see them responding to stimuli in similar ways that you do. But those are symptoms. It's not an actual, de it's not an actual demonstration of consciousness because it's perfectly reasonable to conclude that those people were philosophical zombies who just responded to stimuli, although they weren't actually experiencing anything. The very nature of consciousness is it's only subjectively available. It can never be objectively demonstrated. Only symptoms and derivatives of it can be demonstrated. Because my consciousness is what it feels like to be me and my own personal private thoughts and voiceover and experience of the world, it's never subjectively available. It's never objectively available. It's always only subjectively available. And only through that subjective reality does the rest of the objective world even make sense. Without consciousness, the idea of science and objective proof doesn't even make any sense. Therefore, you don't have a philosophy which accounts for consciousness. Even the idea of empiricism as evidence doesn't make sense. Because it's based on the idea that I'm conscious and can be conscious of facts. Did you guys follow this? Did I lose you? We live in a biocentric universe where consciousness is at the center of everything. And even your ability to understand objective truths about the world, the size of this table or the temperature outside, is based on you being conscious individually. Therefore, that has the first thing that has to be explained. And without that, faith in your senses or objective truth or empirical evidence shouldn't even exist because you haven't even proven your conscious mind, your subjective experience, which is how you can even process objective evidence in the first place. Did you follow that? Did you follow it now? So we should not expect proof of all things to be equal. The fact that something exists, we should then look for proof which is reasonable. And so if somebody says, you know, prove to me that, that, that there's karma from life to life, well, what would you accept as proof? We think it makes sense that you shouldn't remember what happens from life to life. Therefore, we don't think it's reasonable. I mean, do you remember what you ate for lunch 7,472 days ago? Well, first of all, you've got to be over, you gotta be over 20. Otherwise, you wouldn't remember because you wouldn't be born yet. Or maybe if you were born, you'd be a few months old and it's probably your mother's milk. But 
But, you know, I was, I was around at that time. I was in my late 20s. I don't remember what I ate on that given day. I know I ate something, but I don't remember what. Is that proof I didn't eat anything on that day? No. <laughs> There's all sorts of things which exist, which are historical, which are facts, but you can't remember. No one can remember. There's no way to prove it. I can guess, you know, during that time of my life, I was eating like way too much and like a lot of grains. And I can, I can like look at a picture of myself in that time and kind of guess what my diet was probably consisting of at that time. Um, so it's not always reasonable to expect a remembrance of everything that happened. And that a lack of remembrance means it didn't happen. So sometimes people say, well, you know, there's suffering or we don't remember, and that's proof God doesn't exist. And your answer to that should be, okay, so if I can come up with a reasonable theory that would account for that phenomena that you just described and still be consistent with an all-good, all-powerful deity, then you have to give up that argument for the rest of history. I never want to hear that argument out of your mouth again. You follow? Then they go, no. They, oh, there's other reasons. No, no, I have other reasons. Okay, then give me those other reasons. Because I don't want to deal with an argument. That, that, you get what I'm saying? And so there are certain things where it's abduction. If I believe in God, if I've gotten over that threshold and I believe God exists, I can start thinking about the nature of the world. I don't know. Forgetfulness seems totally reasonable to me. If you didn't have the ability to forget, you wouldn't have free will. If you knew that every single thing you did was going to come back to you, the weight of that would stop you. It's like if you're being followed by a cop, you break the law. I mean, speak for yourself. <laughs> if, you, if you're being followed by a cop, you, we break the law, we don't break the law. Right? So if you've got full remembrance and full knowledge that every single thing you've ever done has come back to you, that's a straitjacket. A loving deity would have to give us free will. Because you've got to choose love. Free will means you've got to forget. A loving deity, all good deity, would give us a reaction. Because without that reaction, you wouldn't be able to learn. You'd live in a chaotic world. When we look around the world, we see the world follows logic. That would mean the creator of the world was logical. You look at the byproduct, you understand something about the source. A chaotic world would not allow us to love and grow as well as a logical world would. A world without some reaction would not inspire us to move forward. Therefore, a world of karma is more merciful than a chaotic world with no karma. A world with forgetfulness is more consistent with an all-good deity, as is a world of karma, than a world without such things. And through abduction, through reasoning to the best conclusion, once you've accepted God exists, you can start to think about the world and the nature of God and how God is consistent with the world in which we find. And along the way, you give up hating God or getting angry because he didn't give you this or that, and you start realizing you have lessons to learn. Now, maybe you can't understand all the details of it, but you don't always have to know all the details. Like, if, if you meet somebody who's like, I want to love you and trust you, but I have to examine every single thing you've ever done for all of recorded history before I'll ever be able to trust you. What's the nature of such trust and love? The nature of love is it makes you vulnerable. There has to be some endorsement of the person, some trusting of the person. It's always a gift. We talk about trust being earned, but the nature of trust is it's always a gift. At least loving trust, where the trust or uh, uh, um, is 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 uh, given responsibility for the trustee in some capacity. And the trustee trusts the trustor to perform. And if it's a fact, it's guaranteed, it's not really trust. 
it becomes more mechanistic. And so even the idea that we can't understand everything, why should we be able to? We're not omniscient. But we can understand at least enough that we can reasonably trust, logically trust, intelligently trust. So even the idea of like not being able to know everything, but being able to understand the basic principles of it, and getting a reaction for what we get, and forgetting from lifetime to lifetime, all these ideas which vex people and disturb them are totally consistent with an all-good deity. And once, you, once you've taken like, the existence of God off the table and you've got people to believe in God, you can start to reason through this stuff really well and really go somewhere. And like our tradition has a beautiful idea about God. God's a child. You can love God the way a parent loves a child. That's more intimate because it's more about you giving and less about you receiving. Loving God as your parent, it's a little bit weak. They're doing stuff for you and then you feel grateful. So we flip the script. We love God as a child. That's why Krishna's a child. Krishna's Cupid. Really, Krishna consciousness is the idea that Cupid is God. Who is Cupid? Love personified. Romance personified. You follow? That's who Cupid is in Greek and Roman mythology. Romance personified. Our idea is that is the cause of all causes. The transcendental Cupid. Calm, Dave. The god of lust. The god of... I mean, calm actually means sex in many... many. It's like the, the god of sex, the god of lust, the god of desire, the god of love. That's Krishna. One of Krishna's name is calm, Dave. It kind of says it all a loving deity, an intimately available deity, a romantically available deity, who's vulnerable, who's open, and who's also the cause of all causes. Because a God who couldn't love, a God who wasn't vulnerable couldn't love, a God who wasn't relative couldn't love, a God who wasn't passive in some sense couldn't love. God can't always be active and not passive because passivity, empathy, compassion, these things depend on some degree of relativity and being affected by those around you. And so a God who wasn't capable of being affected by things around him wouldn't be capable of empathy and compassion, therefore wouldn't be a full conception of divinity. You see the kind of like amazing stuff you can do? Once you get God exists as off the table, you can start to really paint an idea. And that's Krishna. So the verses we discussed yesterday, they had Krishna romantically like, like running after us, crying out to us, asking us for like just to turn towards him a little bit, being willing to forgive whatever we've done wrong, making himself available for the price of a song, promising from his side first, and doing a risk reversal where it's like, I'm promising you if you'll just like, like he's asking us to marry him. Acknowledging our free will. Using emphatic language and imperative language, but not to force us to just let us know how much he cares. Simplifying things. Making them easy. Getting rid of, like, you know, unnecessary ritual. It's a picture of divinity. A beautiful picture of divinity. Like an earth-shatteringly beautiful picture of divinity. And so that's really what we're doing. We're trying to understand the nature of divinity. Not every nook and cranny, but the important stuff, so we can fall in love. You gotta believe the person exists at the start, so you gotta cover that stuff. But at a certain point, that's been demonstrated sufficiently, and now you gotta start to think about who is Krishna in my life? What is Krishna's nature? This whole idea of Krishna's punishing me. Well, if Krishna's punishing you, guess what? You deserve it. He's not punishing you. You punished yourself. You ran away. He let the law of cause and effect take place, and you're getting just what you deserved. In fact, you're getting way less than what you deserved. You're getting just the bare minimum of what you deserved to learn your lesson. Because Krishna doesn't want anybody to suffer unnecessarily. You get it? Well, why won't Krishna give me this? Probably because it's really not good for you. 
He just loves you so much. He knows you're going to just like, you know, steer off a cliff. And so he's not giving it to you. He's keeping you humble. He's got amazing stuff in store for you. Interestingly, the, the person who wrote to me yesterday, they said, I feel like the same experience I had when I first started coming. I had this like experience of like joy and hope in my heart of like the, like the infinitude of possibility in my life. And I had that same experience last night, which was wild because like I thought I'd just get that the first week I came, but now I got it again eight months later. I have that experience regularly, weekly, if not daily, 33 years later. It's like, it's oceanic, the possibilities. The stuff you can see. The stuff you can understand. The stuff you can accept. The stuff you can grow from. There's no limit to it. You can have those kind of magical experiences regularly for the rest of your life. You can be confident in them. Because Krishna's loving, cares about you so much, is in love with you. Wants nothing more than to help you. All you need to do is just turn a little bit. Become a little bit Krishna unmuk. Turning your face towards Krishna. Instead of bahir muk. Turning your face away from Krishna. If you just turn a little bit towards Krishna, that's all you really have to do. Open that door. Crack your heart open. Love will pour in. Depth will pour in. Realizations will come. Miracles will occur. Way better than what you thought you wanted. You had some dumb Christmas list. You know, I want a St. Louis Blues jersey, a Serbian cross, and some walkie-talkies, instead of some stuff from my Christmas list as a kid growing up. Way bigger than that. Big stuff. Ecstatic love. Visions of divinity. Touching eternity, walking on the sun, seeing beyond this universe, embracing the absolute. Miracles. We're asking for like a better grade on our test, even though we didn't study, or like a raise we don't deserve. Crap, stupid stuff like that. Krishna wants to give us the world. So, I appreciated this text yesterday because even though the person's only been around for five minutes, they, they did understand what we're doing. We are trying to paint a picture. This is God. This is Krishna. This is his nature. And from that comes everything. How do I relate to him? How do I think about him? How do I pray to him? How do I connect with him? What are the rituals we engage in? When is it too, too much ritual? It's become ritualistic. When is it too much philosophy? It's become, you know, like, like overly intellectual. And you can start to feel your way back to divinity. Everything starts to make perfect sense and all fits together. Doubts evaporate. You really start to be able to see through the matrix to what's really going on. That's good theology. To some extent, we've got to be unfettered by like, the argument for God's existence. Like, every time that comes up, I'm like, hey man, like, why did you like, ask me to dance when you don't know how to dance? Like, we're going to go get you out of the club right now. You follow? Like, you, need, like, you don't just, you don't you get, you get your ID to get in the club. Go get, go get an ID. It could be 21. Then come back in the club and we'll dance. Do you understand? There's so much beautiful stuff that can happen once that first question has been answered. And so much time when you talk to people about the nature of God, they reveal to you that they're closet atheists. They're not real theists. They're closet atheists. Haven't figured any of it out. Just pretending, fronting, showing a fake ID, waving the flag, wrapping themselves in the flag, 
but without a lot of depth. Anytime you have that, like, oh, but what, does God even exist? And the, when you, 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 you should understand from that that you need to go back outside and mo- memorize your multiplication tables better. You follow? It's good. That's good. Stay out there and learn your lessons. Learn how to spell. Practice writing the alphabet. Learn your multiplication tables. Learn basic arithmetic. Spend as much time out there as you want. We'll come out. We teach that stuff too. We teach that stuff too. But sometimes when those doubts go away and they evaporate and you want to come in, then let us paint. A beautiful picture. Let it pull at your heartstrings. Find answers to questions you didn't even know to ask. Do you guys follow this? That's what I thought of today when I read that text. I mean, I kind of like thought of it in like a second, and I thought I'll just work it out here in front of you guys. But then you weren't paying attention, and I myself am doing the math. And so I don't got to worry about like waking you guys up from your weird, drunken stupor. And I, at the same time, I have to think through stuff that doesn't work. So I need the attention so I can do my thing and work through it. I, I, what, you, what you wrote made me think of this. Like, I like just a kind of a, like a, like a seed like idea. And I want to open up and share it with you guys today. Abduction is beautiful. You know, reasoning to the best conclusion. A lot of times with abduction, you have, you have your major premise, and then you're missing your minor premise. And so you have to guess in order to reach a conclusion. Different than deduction. All men are mortal. Socrates is man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Different than that. Different than induction, where I, you know, I have an observation. I saw somebody die, therefore I think all men might die. In abduction, you have your major premise. You know, you all, all men are mortal, and then this guy died. Well, maybe he's a man, or maybe all life forms also die. Like you're, you're, there's still some guesswork in there, but you're reasoning through it logically. You know, like adduction, an adductive exercise versus an abductive exercise. Ah, ah. Adductive, moving towards the center line. Abduction, moving away from the center line. You've got your center point and you're moving away from it and extrapolating from it. And there's room for that. You don't, I, some, a lot of things are understood abductively. Not everything has a deductive or even, uh, uh, even you know, an inductive uh, um, uh, evidence. And even induction is always strong or weak. It's never you know, uh, valid or invalid. Only deductive proofs are valid or invalid, necessarily true, because you have all your premises. Anytime you're working uh, um, um, in an inductive way, it's always a strong or weak argument. But once you're in this realm where you believe God exists, those arguments, you start to realize that there's lots of things about the world where that's actually a good argument. That's a strong argument. That's a reasonable argument. That's an astute argument. That's an argument I can work with. I know God exists. I know he's all good. Now I can start to think about the nature of the world I find myself in and my relationship with Didi, and I can start to see all sorts of possibilities. And the same way at some point you know he loves you or she loves you. And you know that I looked at the straight guy and said he loves you, and I looked at the gay guy and said she loves you. Whatever. (laughs) In the same way at some point you know somebody loves you, somebody cares about you, somebody's there for you, somebody's got your back. At a certain point, It's like, how do they get there? I don't know, they just do. We have that capacity. It's not just, there's some art to it. There's some trust in there. But it's not blind. But it's artistic. It's not merely mathematical. And so what, 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 just this young devotee, what they got was, they got the picture of God that Krishna paints. His own picture, his own words. And they found that to be stunning and beautiful and inspirational and 
beguiling and even seductive. And they wanted to be close. They felt embraced by that person. They felt that Krishna really cared about them. And they felt giddy. Same way you feel giddy when that guy texts you back and like you know, sends you the right emojis. Did you guys follow that? In the beginning, it's like, does God exist or not? Grade school, super important. Got to spend years there. Years. Get good at it. Learn all your multiplication tables. Learn all the arguments, and then like, learn how to believe them. <laughs> Let them wear away on you, like water wearing away stone. Wear away at your stone-like heart. At some point, those doubts, they evaporate and you actually start to believe in God. As Prabhupada said, faith is unflinching trust in something divine. You start to have that. You start to move in that direction. And once you get there, you can, you can dabble, you can cross over that threshold and you can start to think about the nature of divinity. And if you do that properly, our entire practice flows like the Ganga naturally from our conception of divinity. Our conception of divinity explains everything you ever want about the Hare Krishnas. And then it starts to all become really beautiful. It's like you know, one of the reasons for why do the, why do the artists paint the, 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 the sky that color? Well, I mean, one argument is blue and he's trying to represent reality. But also sometimes the, art, the answer to the question like why the artists paint that color? Because that's just like, he picked that beautiful color to paint. Krishna has a beautiful nature. It's logos, but it's beyond logos. It goes beyond mere logic. It becomes beautiful and artistic and romantic and intimate and outreach and loving, drawing us closer. Even your karma, the way it manifests, even the suffering you go through, even the lessons you're forced to learn, even the things you don't get, even the things you do get, even the things that are taken away in due course of time, even the quote-unquote missed opportunities or the things that just fell in your lap, all of this starts to come together. And you just start to feel like Krishna's been pulling me towards him the whole time. I just as I let go, he just keeps pulling me closer. As I like, won't let go, then he like, gives me space and waits forever for me to open that door again and let go a little bit so it can pull me closer to him. Krishna's never failed me. He's always been there for me. So much more than what I deserve. I'm so lucky. Devotees universally have these experiences. Universally, they can see through so much apparent suffering and difficulty and just find incredible meaning and growth. It's not that they're making that up. It's there. They're just miners and seekers of the truth and they find it. And then, you know, at some point, you know, it's like you're dabbling in the realm of art. And then you got to go back out and do your multiplication tables again. You didn't realize it. you weren't done with them yet. And you go back and forth and back and forth. So someday you just get to live in the, in the artistic realm. And you've learned those. You, they're always there. And you can go back and bring people in, help them cross over the threshold. But then you live here. In a beautiful, magical world. You don't have to know everything. But you know everything you need to. You know everything you need to. All right. I spoke my piece. Thank you, IGTV, very much. Give me some feedback, guys.